All right, so in this chapter, we will extend the solution from these two images to a whole sequence. So first of all, of course, we go to the movie clip editor and then open up the whole clip. So go to the folder with the footage, camera tracking, old factory, and then load the whole sequence here in the movie clip. So open that and then just right away Alt A to playback and to cache that into the RAM. And even though the sequence is a little bit longer than 250 frames, we will just leave it at that. Okay, so now we've got that in the RAM and we can start tracking. And well, to make things easy, we just pick the exact same points that we picked for the two frames in the last chapter. So that was something up here, that point here. And something that I like to do is to really track them one by one. First of all, tracking is very fast in Blender, so it won't take that much longer. And also we can concentrate on the markers while they are tracking. So if something goes wrong, maybe because you have uh, too fast motion or too much blur, then you can immediately go ahead and correct that. So now that we've got the marker set, we can track that forward by pressing this button here and you can see at frame 168 it fails. So maybe we should have pressed L in the first place, like so, so that we can now go ahead and bring the marker back on track by hitting G and then move it here so that it is exactly on the same spot as before. Maybe check that by going one frame back and it seems that we have to move it a little bit more here to the center of that point, like so, and then continue on tracking either by clicking this button here or by using the hotkey or going frame by frame by holding down the alt key and then a uh, right arrow. Okay, so that is finished and we can lock it off. Locking a marker is something that we didn't use yet, but especially if you're going to use some more markers, then it can be helpful to just lock them so that you don't accidentally select them and then continue tracking them. So locking a marker will kind of freeze it. And to do that, you can go up here in the track panel and then activate this lock icon. Or you can also use a shortcut and that shortcut is Control L. And if I deselect that marker now by hitting A, you can see that it is now grayed out. And if you select it, you cannot move it because it is locked. Okay, so now let's go back to frame one by hitting shift left arrow and then select the next feature. And I believe it was something up here, this corner that we can track. And now let's do that. First press L to center the view to that feature and then hit control T to track it forward. All right, here it failed just because here there is quite a bit of motion and motion blur. So here, let's bring it back on track by hitting the G key, bring it back here in the corner, then compare to the previous frame. That's better. And then Alt right arrow to continue on tracking. Okay, also Control L to lock it and Shift left arrow to go back to frame one. And that's basically what we're going to do with all the eight points that we had tracked in the previous chapter. And maybe we can also track a few more. So let's go ahead and choose the point here on the column. So control left mouse button click and drag here to place that here on this column on this point. And now again, control T to track it. And then also maybe we can collapse the marker display, go to tracking settings, and set it to real time instead of fastest. Or maybe let's use double. Double and we can still see what's going on, but it won't be that slow. Okay, so control T. And now we can really nicely see if everything works. So that went right, so control L. And now since we are on the last frame, maybe we don't always have to go to the first frame. We can just place a new marker and then just simply track backwards. So that would be this button here. Uh, in my case, the shortcut is Control Command T, but that is my own custom shortcut. I'm not exactly sure what the shortcut is for you. Maybe Control Shift T or Control Alt T or something like that. Or just press this button here. 
And you can see how smooth and accurate that tracks, even though the footage is not that sharp, even though there is some motion blur and some faster motion, it still is pretty good. Even on these frames where you have really a bunch of motion blur, it still manages to kind of stick to the original position. So that is great. And that is because of the tracking algorithm that we are using. And I can show you that on the next marker. So let's go back to frame one and pick this point here that we had also in the previous chapter. And then have a look at the tracking settings. Even though we don't really need to change something here because it just works fine currently, uh, you might want to, in some cases, you might want to change some of these settings here. So first of all, here in the tracking settings, you can set the pattern size and the size for the search area. Now, I have to say that the size of 51 is wrong. That is my own default, which is wrong. It should be 61. And I guess that for you, it will be 61. And that is actually much better. So there is some kind of messed up defaults in my case, but still it works pretty good. Okay, now what is the search size? I think I showed you already in the chapter before, but just in case uh, I want to enable the search area and I can do that by going to marker display and then enable this checkbox for the search area or there is also a hotkey for that and that is Alt S. Alt S will display the search area. You can increase the size of the search area by dragging this little arrow here or by going down to the marker settings and there you can also increase the size. But of course, just dragging this triangle is much faster. And to be honest, I have never used this panel here. It is nice that we have it, but personally, I've never used it. So I just generally, I just keep it collapsed down there. Okay, so that is that. And then the next thing is you can choose a tracking algorithm. So currently this is set to hybrid and hybrid is really a very, very good tracking algorithm. Before, in the beginning of the development of this tracker, we only had the KLT tracker. Then later we had the SAD tracker and well, the best is the third one, the hybrid tracker. Okay, let's first track this forward by hitting Control T. And when it has finished, maybe we can try something with a different algorithm. So go back to frame one, control L to lock it. And then let's go, where could we go? Um, here. That was a corner that we also had in the previous chapter. And for that corner, just to show you the difference, I want to track with a different algorithm. So maybe we can switch from hybrid to SAD and then control click here as well, like so, and then control T to track that. Okay, first thing that we have to pay attention to is that here on this point, we have the danger of sliding. You know, there is this column here moving into this direction so it starts to occlude this corner and because the column is so bright, in fact, it's almost the same color as the wall back there. So we have the risk of sliding marker because the marker will just use that corner of this contrast here. And it could be that the marker is sliding. So let's clear everything after frame 244. And you can do that here in the track panel with clear after or by using the hotkey Alt T. So you can see the blue line is gone and so is the yellow line down here. So everything here, the marker will be just disabled. So there will be no track and no tracking data. And that is fine because in some cases, no tracking data is better than wrong tracking data. Okay, so that's the first thing about this marker. Then the second thing is that the SAD algorithm is more jittery than the other ones. So if you watch this marker up here, maybe you can see that it is more jittering. Of course, it is rather blurry back there, but still 
I think that the hybrid tracker would be able to produce something that is a little bit smoother than the SAD tracker. Because SAD is not able to have sub-pixel precision, but hybrid and the, the other one, KLT, both are able to give you sub-pixel precision. So let's lock this marker, control L, and then on the same position, add another marker, but with a different algorithm. And by the way, I should mention that if I would now change the tracking algorithm here and continue on tracking, that will not change anything for this currently active marker. Because these settings are global settings for a new marker. But if you have already created a marker, then you would have to use the tracking settings down here. So these are the settings for the currently active individual marker. Then you can change that. So if I would change it here, that will now in fact have an impact on this marker here. And these are the global settings for newly created markers. So with that locked, let's go ahead and create a hybrid tracking marker right here in the same position. And then let's see what happens. It could very well be that it will be the exactly same result, but just let's see. So control T. And it has finished. And I think it is pretty obvious that this is more stable and that the SAD marker is jittering around that point. I mean, you could also argue that the other one is jittering. So who's right? Well, I would just say hybrid is better. But maybe we can easier control which of these tracks is better by having a look at the actual curve of the speed of these markers. And you can do that by going here and enable the curve view and then enable both markers. So shift right click on this marker so that both are active. And now we have to zoom in to really see that. So let me see. Um, so now the hybrid marker is active. And even though they are doing more or less the same, you can see that this curve is a little bit smoother than the other one. And these curves are representing the speed curves of the markers along the X and Y axis. So when I now grab these markers and move them like so along the, the Y axis, maybe I should go to that frame. So on that frame, when I now move these markers along the Y axis, you can see how the green line is changing. And if I do the same along the X axis, with GX, the red curve is changing. And these values here that are represented by this curve, that are not the actual pixels, that is really just the speed of these markers. So when there is a sudden jump, you will have a spike because there is a sudden increase in the speed. And when you have a jittering marker, you will have kind of these little tiny spikes here. So that's why the SAD marker, which I select here. So that is now the SAD marker. Hmm, come on. So that is SAD. So that has these little spikes here because it is a little bit more jittery than the other one. And because the hybrid tracking algorithm is producing smoother curves, it is better than the SAD algorithm. So let's just go ahead and delete the track of the SAD tracker. And then as a last algorithm, we have KLT. And KLT is very similar to the hybrid tracker. Now, before I can continue, I have to reload my footage because obviously something went wrong with QuickTime again. So we have the marker here and it would be on the correct place if the frame was actually correct. But if I now go to the next frame, you can see a sudden jump. So something's wrong with the footage again. So let's just reload by going to the footage settings and then click the reload button. And then before we do anything else with Alt A, let's cache everything into the RAM and that should then hopefully fix that issue. And I want to repeat that with an image sequence, you won't have that uh, issue, but of course you will have the trouble of creating that sequence first and uh, well, filling up your hard drive. So with that, we can go up here and then create a new marker, use 
KLT for that. Control left click here and then place that on the exact same position. And you can see that we now have not only the search area and the pattern area, now we have that dashed line and this dashed line is something called pyramid levels. So currently we are using two pyramid levels and I cannot really tell you how that exactly works. But uh, the more pyramid levels you have and also if you have a bigger search area, the more precision you will get. So if you increase that, then you will add another level that the KLT tracker can work on, but also you have to increase the search area for that. So it's something that uh, on KLT, the tracker is first using this big area, then it narrows down the search to the next pyramid level, then to the next level and to the next level and so on. And thereby you can really get precise and sub-pixel precision. But well, the KLT algorithm has some other problems that the hybrid tracker doesn't have. So well, I would just use always the hybrid. But anyway, let's go back to the default setting of two pyramid levels and see what happens if we track that. Control T, L to lock that to the view. And there is no jittering as we had with SAD. So in fact, it's almost exactly the same as hybrid. And if you look at both curves, there's really barely any difference here. But also here, just as before, hybrid is a little bit better. If I select the KLT, so there's also a little bit more speed increase. So that is a little bit more jittery. But other than that, it really seems to be exactly the same. But well, as I've said, the KLT algorithm has some other problems. For example, it seems to have a hard time to deal with changes in the lighting, which the hybrid tracker doesn't have. So I would just say always use hybrid because it's awesome and it's fast. All right, so let's also just delete the KLT marker. And then let's have a look at the other settings that you can do here. So uh, maybe let's just use a new marker for that. We don't always have to deal with the same one. So which of our markers didn't we have? All right, that one down here. So back on frame one, I can place a new marker here. Now, before I do that, of course, I have to change the tracking settings again to hybrid and then also the size of the search area to 61, like it should be. Now, there is some more things here. For example, you have this correlation value. Now, the correlation value um, is something with that you can tell the tracker how confident it can be to the tracks that it generates. So, for example, if the correlation is at something really high, like, I don't know, 0 0.99 or so, then if I now hit Control T, it should, at least in theory, it should stop sooner. Ah, no, it didn't. It's just too good. Hmm. All right. Um, Okay, so maybe this feature was just too good for me to show you the issues that we might have. So um, let's just live with that. Control L to lock it off. And then let me try to show you the correlation value on something else. Maybe, I don't know, maybe something here that is really hard to track, at least in theory, it should be hard to track. So when I now hit Control T to track it, it will just stop on frame two. Okay, so that stopped very early. But when I now change the correlation value of this marker and remember to not do that here, if you want to change the values of this particular marker, then you have to do that here in the settings for that one track. So if I set the correlation to something rather low, like, I don't know, 0 0.4 or so, and hit Control T, then it will just track. So this helps, obviously, to help Blender to just track certain things. Um, but what you can see maybe that there is... I'm not even sure if there is some sliding. I can't really tell because the white thing here is really just going away. I believe that there might be a little bit of sliding. A little bit here to the right, but actually I'm not exactly sure. So anyway, the point is that with the correlation value, you can convince Blender to just keep on tracking something 
even if it is not as sure if on the next frame the feature really is the same as before. So that can really help you to get Blender track something. So that is the correlation value. Okay, let's set it back to the default of 0 0.75 or so. And then just lock the marker since I think it might be okay. Or actually, I don't know. Oh, well, let's, let's just live with that. Let's see. If it will produce an error later, we can still delete it. Okay, so what's left? That orange thing back there. So let's add another marker. So keep the pattern size, the search area, hybrid and correlation, and then have a look at the frames limit. So when you add a frames limit, for example, 10, and you place the marker and start tracking with control T, it will just stop after 10 frames. And that can be very helpful if you have uh, footage that is very hard to track, where you know that it will produce errors and you will have to put it back on track, then you can start tracking here in steps of 10 frames so that you can always intervene if something goes wrong. But usually uh, it will just track or if it doesn't track then it will just stop and be disabled. So then you can help it continue tracking. So just use that if you want to. Oh, of course, and you see I'm doing the same error all the time again. So I just wanted to turn this off, but I did it over here, so that doesn't work, of course. So you have to do that here. So now it will just keep on tracking as long as it can, and it tracked just fine. Okay, so that is that. We can lock it off with Control L, and I believe that's mostly it one two three four five six seven eight nine so we could start solving that but before i want to add some more markers not because i think that i have to help blender in any way but i want to help myself and i want to do that by choosing some markers here in the window frame because if i have points in the 3d scene later um, on meaningful places like that one that can of course help me to uh, model a virtual building or will just help me to orient myself where these markers are. So it's always good to place markers on places where you think it might be helpful later in 3D. Okay, Control T to track that and I think this footage is so easy to track that we can just go back to real-time tracking. Or actually not to real-time, but to fastest. So that was just great, Control L. And before we do anything else, let's go to the tracking settings and set the speed to fastest. Okay, so then select maybe this corner. And since we are on the last frame, track backwards to the first frame, press L, see if it fits. And yes, it does. That looks awesome. So control L to lock it off. I mean, you don't really have to lock it. It's just sometimes it's really easier to not run the risk of uh, accidentally tracking something. So in that case, you can always lock them, but I mean, it's not always necessary. But you can see that with the fastest setting, it's really just a matter of a fracture of a second to track for 250 frames. So it's really just super fast. Okay. That we've got that and maybe something more on the floor and especially on the floor in the foreground because the foreground is the place where you have the most perspective shift and that means that things that are in the foreground for example here on the floor will move much faster and provide much more perspective information than things that are in the background in this case it's not that far away but if this door would be open and you would track something in the really far background, then the features might just move a very small distance, but features that are in the foreground will move rather far. So that means that if you place a marker here in the foreground, it will travel a much longer distance over the shot than something that is in the background. Okay, but before I add this marker here, I want to show you one more setting that you can do. And that is you can switch the matching from keyframe to previous frame. So every marker that we have tracked until now has tried to match the keyframe that it has started with. So as soon as you add a marker here, you will automatically insert a keyframe. Now let me track some frames forward 
and maybe you can see that here on the first frame the yellow is a little bit more saturated than here. And that means that there is a keyframe and Blender will try to match the pattern that it has recorded here on the first frame. So everything that is inside here that will be tried to match to how the pattern looked like on frame one. But if you now grab the marker and move it, for example, if you set it back on track, you will automatically set a new keyframe. So if I track a few frames forward now, there will be another yellowish point. And that means that if I now take the marker and put it on something completely different and continue on tracking, then this will now be the reference. And that is the keyframe. So when I now track backwards, it will also overwrite that keyframe. It will not jump back. That is the current behavior. Eventually that might be changed in the future, but currently Blender will just take this as the new keyframe and overwrite everything behind it or before that. Okay, so anyway, so that is the keyframe setting. That setting can lead to failing tracks if you have hard to track footage, for example, if it is very blurry or very fast. In these cases, it might be easier if you have Blender not trying to match that keyframe, but just always try to match the previous frame. So let me delete that and change that from keyframe to previous frame. So with that set, when I create a new marker and press L to lock it, it will still track just as fine as before because this footage is perfect to track. It's super easy, so there is no problem in tracking that. But the point is that now Blender doesn't try to match the pattern that it has seen on the first frame. It would always try to match the previous frame. Okay, so that being said, it doesn't make a difference in this case, but in future shots, the previous frame setting might really help you to get a decent track. In this case, it doesn't really make a difference because it also tracks fine with the match set to keyframe. Okay, so we can lock that off and then just add some more tracks, maybe something here on this column. And just to try, let's see how it looks like with previous frame. So control T and it tracks just fine. Okay, so with that, um, I think we're mostly finished with these settings here. Some more of these settings will be covered in the next chapters, but for now, I think we can just set these back to the defaults. And speaking of defaults, maybe I can show you this. So you have this drop down menu where you can change between different settings. For example, you have blurry footage. You can see how the pattern size increases, how this is now set to previous frame as well. You have fast motion where the pattern size in search areas is even larger. But also there is the default setting. And here you can see this is now set to 11 and 61 and also set to keyframe. So that is the default setting. Now we will collapse that. And now we most certainly have enough tracks to get a decent solution from that. All right, so just as before, we can collapse these panels here. We don't need them anymore. And we can start solving that by pressing the solve camera motion button. And well, the solve error is not that good. It is above one. I mean, it is kind of okay, but it could be definitely much better because I'm pretty sure that our tracks are fine. Maybe let's have a look at that by selecting everything by hitting A twice because we had something selected before. And now let's zoom in here and look at that. So all the tracks are doing more or less the same, of course, with some differences. So there are no sudden spikes. Everything is kind of even and smooth. And that is exactly how it should look like. So something else is missing. And the information that we are missing is the information about the camera. Because it has a huge impact on the whole solution. If this scene has been shot with a wide angle lens or with a zoom lens, which kind of sensor you have been using and all that stuff. So the information about the camera is really important. So let's go here in the properties panel to the camera data. So expand that. And you can see that you can now enter a bunch of stuff here. For example, there are a couple of presets with some camera models. 
um, then you can enter the focal length, the sensor size, the pixel aspect ratio, the optical center and lens distortion. So in my case, I know that I have been filming this shot with uh, a DSLR camera with the Canon 550D. So I enter this preset here and you can see that now the size of the sensor has changed to 22.3 millimeters and the focal length didn't change. That is still set to 24 millimeters. And I know that I have been shooting this with a wide angle lens and it was probably something around 18 millimeters. Let's try if this improves our solution by solving again and we are below one already. I think it can still be improved, but it is a lot better than before. But maybe before I continue, I should explain you what exactly focal length means, what the sensor size is and why it is so important. 